Well, so let's start at the beginning <laughs> and tell me your name, please. <laughs> My name is Dave Kasich. And when were you born? 1949, May 21. And where? In Council Bluffs, Iowa, of all those crazy you, places. You grew up there? I know I grew up in uh, pretty much on the, in Denver primarily, but my parents were itinerant for the first three, four years of my life. And we settled in Denver in 1952, 53 timeframe. What do you mean itinerants? They lived in San Antonio. They lived on the road in the, uh, in the, in Montana, in North Dakota, where my dad sold, sold oil leases. So he moved from hotel to hotel and actually dragged the family with him. Uh, my, myself and my sister. And, uh, and we had, a, it was an interesting, it was an interesting way of growing up. Did he draft you to help with the leases? No, actually what he drafted me to do is, is earn him liquor at bars. I see. Because, what, because I had learned, I had, no, I'm serious. <laughs> when, when he was, he, he, it was, he was a drinking man and uh, he would go into bars in, in these small towns. And he would bet people at the bar that this little two and a half or three year old boy could name the next car, the brand, the make and year of the next car coming down the road. And because I had been trained by my older cousin in Detroit, I was able to do that. And so he won a fair, a fair number of drinks from these folks. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was an interesting way of growing up. <laughs> when I was in high school, my father, in more desperate times, um, uh, procured oil leases. Oh, uh, he did? Yeah. He, you know, we signed people up. And I was tasked with the job of driving around rural Ohio. I think I must have visited every county courthouse in Ohio. Oh, yeah. And doing title research. Or doing oh, yeah, research. yeah. And I enjoyed that a lot. And uh, uh, to this day, I, yeah. where I grew up, which was coal country and now is shale oil country, everybody I went to high school with is now a, who, had a, who has a farm is now a millionaire because of the shale oil in Harrison County and Carroll County. And, oh, yeah? Huh. And so on. Oh, so that, there, you know, that, that's, that's actually very interesting because that's basically what my dad did, but I was a little young to drive at the time. I could name the cars, but I couldn't drive. <laughs> so you went to grade school in Denver? Grade school, high school in, in Denver. And then I wandered to uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University in the late 60s for college. Were you interested in science in high school? I, so I went to a Jesuit high school in Denver. And if you're familiar with Jesuit education, you know that they are not necessarily strong on science, especially in the late 60s. So one of the things that turned out to be that is still is still true is that my modern language in high school was Latin. And my second language was Homeric Greek. So there were not a large number of people who got involved in science and engineering out of high school. Lots of lawyers, lots of uh, authors and writers and people who do various uh, more business-like things, but there were about there were about a dozen of us who went off into science and engineering. How did you go wrong? Uh, somehow, somehow I actually liked math back in the day, and math was a was a you know so I I, I enjoyed it. I did well at, at, in high school. I do give credit for high school for teaching me how, what the English language is, was all about and appreciating good reading and good literature. Um, but it turns out that, that it was not a wonderful basis for doing high, high end, any kind of, any kind of um, scientific work. When I got to Johns Hopkins, I learned differently. Because what did you learn was, there? So Johns Hopkins basically is, was a, an all-male an all male college, a university at the time. Uh, there were female graduate students, and clearly the medical school had, had uh, females associated with it. But if you remember at the time of the late 60s, it was a time that was fraught with all sorts of demonstrations, with uh, assassinations of, of, of high-profile people. Moving from a city like Denver, which was a small, basically a cow town, 
uh, in the 60s, through, the, through most of the 60s, and through, certainly all through the 60s and much of the 70s. Uh, and going to a place that actually had slums and marches on Washington and activists and people who were trying to make changes in the way the United States was treating the war in Vietnam and reacted to events like the assassination of Robert Kennedy, the assassination of Martin Luther King, made it a highly active and interesting time. It's not always where, when you can live in an apartment in Baltimore and you have troop movements in front of your house. Mm -hmm. uh, and walking through Baltimore and Washington, D.C., which where I visited quite a bit because of relatives there, those people, you learned a lot about what was life like in a totally different environment where people actually were impoverished, um, where they were living in situations that really turned out to be intolerant. You watched places that were, especially in DC, where there were significant amounts of, um, there was a significant amounts of areas that were, that were burned. Um, large collections of people. So it was a time that was fraught with an extraordinary number of, um, a lot of unrest and a lot of dissent, a lot of disagreement. Um, what happened that is different from today clearly is that there was a lot more compromise and people trying, tried to make progress in spite of all of the uh, differences. Um, but when I, when, when I got to Hopkins, I actually tried to be a math major for a while and was defeated by topology and decided and took a computer class as a freshman, as a first, first semester junior, did well enough in that computer class that the staff, the, the two professors who were teaching it, um, recommended me to a person named Bill Huggins. And Huggins was a uh, guy who wound up uh, as a professor taking a year of sabbatical and working at Bell Labs for, for a, a year, for a year, either the year or the, a, a couple of years before he started doing computer animation at, at Johns Hopkins. And so he recruited me to, me to, to program and design computer animated films in 1969. And I went on from there. What software um, did you use at Hopkins? Uh, so Hopkins had an interesting computer center. It was in the basement of the library. And the library at Hopkins was named for Milton Eisenhower. It was in the very bottom layer. It was a underground library. The only thing, the first floor was on, was above ground. And D level was the lowest level. It was all below ground. It was an IBM 7094. Software in those days for doing animation was custom software, at least what I was assigned to use. It was a set of macros that were programmed in IBM 7094 um, assembly language. It required a special operating system. And the only time the operators would load that operating system for me to make any runs was about uh, 1130 or 12 o'clock at night. And so I was up late I, the operators would reboot the machine with my specific um, uh, software. Uh, they'd give me one and maybe on a really good night, two runs. I could do all my animation debugging using uh, line printer output and keyframes. So it was an unusual way of trying to get fast turnaround. And in spite of that, I was able to make two films um, basically doing electrical education, uh, 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 electrical education sorts of things. Uh, the films themselves were not, Hopkins did not have microphone recorders at the time. So the films themselves were produced at, uh, at uh, Brooklyn Polytechnic in New York. And so we sent tapes to Brooklyn Poly where they processed it, they sent me back one sample run and I had to make the final run based on my single film, 16 millimeter film. 
And remarkably enough, the final product turned out to be what I wanted. <laughs> that is awesome. But it, I'm sorry, it was called the make break switch. It was the one that I'm most famous for in those days. <laughs> I, and it was done in stunning black and white. And it was probably mm. recorded on a, on a, a ST4020 or an ST4060. It was an SC4020. And there was I, one, there were three of them, I think. There was that one you used, there was one at MIT, and there might have been one at Bell Labs. I'm sure there, there had to be one at Bell Labs. And I, I can imagine knowing uh, with Ken Knowlton and Lillian Schwartz at, at Bell Labs and then... There were people who were then in Nelson Max was doing work um, at MIT at the time. Uh, Nelson was what well, he did a gorgeous series of topology films during the, during that during that time. Um, there was a guy named I think it was it was either Carol or Cheryl Martin who did Cheryl a Cheryl Martin. Of, yeah, he did all, he did a bunch of uh, astronomy films. He uh, adapted a pin registered camera to the ST4020 at MIT, and that was what I shot my first film song. Yeah, so we so we we have similar we have similar chops in that area. And then the other the other thing that was interesting about the Hopkins about the Hopkins experience is that uh, Huggins and another professor named a psychology professor named Doris Entwistle were extremely interested in how people do vision. And they started a graduate seminar called Iconic Communication that I was able to take. There's actually an old book on doing some of the, on, on that topic. Um, but I started getting a, a significant interest in not only the animation piece, but how one actually communicates using pictures. And that set me up for, um, basically the rest of my career and the rest of my life on understanding why, how people see things, how they are able to communicate using those visual metaphors, and then how you can parlay that into highly interactive systems that with which you might actually be able to do something. Okay, so my, my interest segued from doing animation and I was I, I am still a huge fan of animation uh, but the vast majority of my career has been doing highly interactive systems with large amounts of 2d and 3d data so did you do college and graduate school at Hopkins no I did grad school I went to so you remember, so you you actually remember the '60s and '70s, also Judson. So, so, <laughs> and my godmother lived in Baltimore and was the chief dietitian at John Hopkins Hospital. So we went there every Easter, and I have affection for the city. Actually, maybe you don't, but no, well, so so uh, this this would be a, a wonderful side conversation about yeah. one's lasting impressions of Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seeing it as a as a with a relative is a whole lot different from seeing it as an undergraduate and, and watching and just trying to deal with the local populace that was not always friendly to Johns Hopkins Johns Hopkins undergraduates by, by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> well, you know that's the way life is. Um, but in, 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 in point of fact, so it, it was it was a time fraught with not significant employment. It was hard to get a job, which I tried to do out of, out of, uh, after I graduated. Uh, but it turns out that I had a, a, a lovely lady back in, in the Denver area whom I had been dating for a while and uh, she became my first wife. Uh, and I decided that I would apply to graduate school at various places and got into the University of Colorado as a master's student. It was there first year as a formal department, 1970. So I became a teaching assistant at Hopkins and got a master's degree there. And then went off into the free world and tried to work. But it was tough to get a job in 1970. You know, you put in, put in all sorts of paper all around the place and nothing panned out. So were your first programs on paper tape or punch cards? Uh, my very first... <laughs> Programs as a as as an undergrad were literally on, were in fact on paper tape. 
using a, a, a Hewlett Packard timeshare machine that Hopkins that Hopkins leased. Uh, and then I went, then I, I graduated to punch cards for doing all the animation work <laughs> and some, and some side Fortran work. Um, University of Colorado was pretty much all, was all pretty much all pu uh, punch cards at the time. Fortran then? Uh, it was Fortran and assembly language primarily, but there was a, there was a professor there who actually got who actually had broader, more Catholic interests in what was going on with a, with alternate programming language named Bill Waite. Um, and Bill introduced uh, students to joys of uh, Snowball, uh, Algol. Um, he, was, he was good enough that he understood that there were other computer architectures than the control data machines that uh, CU had at the time. And it, it turned out to it turned out that that Wade and I got along pretty well because he actually took some some of my suggestions and tried to offer the original initial programming courses in languages other than Fortran. So we, we tried to introduce students to Snowball and to out into um, assembly language so they'd understand a, a broader a broader scope of, of languages. So the in, thing, in in the Colorado experience, what did you, in terms of your graduate work, in terms of computer graphics on one hand, and in terms of imaging on the other hand? What so so the, 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 the thing about, about CU is that they didn't know what, a, what computer graphics was all about. Literally, you know, it was, it was, not, it was not really part of the department at, the point, at that time. Uh, the, the staff, uh, a guy named Lloyd Fosdick, who ran the department for like 30 years, was a numerical analyst. Um, but it was valuable for building a basis of computing that I could take and apply just about anywhere. So fundamentally, learning about what um, uh, vector machines were like, we did, I did some research into parallel processing early on uh, with the ILLIAC. Uh, at, at Illinois, trying to understand what that was all about. Um, learned a lot about uh, numerical methods and linear algebra, which also turned out to be a wonderful basis for what happens in computer graphics. So, so I was lucky enough to do well in all my coursework. And we wound up, and I wound up being recommended to take a job at in Columbus, Ohio. When when did you first discover pixels? Uh, well, so pixels were not a thing of the future. Were, were some were so I knew about. I clearly knew about pixels from TVs, from television. But quite honestly, the work that I did in animation at Hopkins. Uh, I went to Battelle Columbus Laboratories in 1972 as a, as, uh, as a computer graphics guy, uh, because I always claimed that it was, the reason I got the job was because I could spell graphics correctly. And as a research lab, Battelle was trying to get into the world of computer graphics and sell research along those lines. They had uh, one guy, uh, a guy who became a lo my longtime mentor and, and close friend named Ed Edwards, uh, who passed away about five years ago. Um, but Ed Ed wanted to get into the graphics business because he saw it as a as an up and coming uh, an up and coming topic. Um, Battelle had a control data machine. University of Colorado had a control control data machine. I knew how to spell graphics. They wanted to start a graphics group. So I got, I was the first member of the Battelle computer graphics. Uh, and you, and you, started, you started building graphic software. I started building graphic software. And what was actually pretty interesting is that, that Battelle also had an SD 4060. So they had a microfilm recorder. And there was enough flexibility at Battelle at, at the time that I was able to pursue some more animation projects. So I did more animated films. Um, 
and was able to do some stuff with the with the 4060. But these were all vector devices. Right. Pixels were pixels were available on televisions, but they weren't available on graphics devices per se in any meaningful way, especially interactive devices. The, re the reason I asked is you said you developed an interest in image analysis and, and how images are interpreted. <laughs> Well, so it's more an interest in, in not, it's not really image analysis um, as, as a field uh, doing, doing pixels and scans of the like. And like, it's more, what does an image, how do you construct an image so that it communicates most readily and most completely to the person who's trying to consume it? Let, 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 me, let me ask you to repeat that because I just wasn't paying the attention I should have been to that last sentence. So, you, so images are used as a mechanism to communicate. What I learned at Hopkins was that there are certain tools and techniques that one can use that allow you to construct images that are more communicative than other methods of constructing those images. So, so I was more interested in the design of those images than I was in the post-processing to try to elicit information from them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I give um, Larry Roberts, uh, the former head of DARPA and an MIT guy, uh, a lot of credit for what he did in, in machine, his PhD thesis was machine perception of three-dimensional solids which he failed at, but he introduced homogeneous coordinates to the world of computer graphics. You, you probably have a copy of his book on homogeneous coordinates and transformation matrices and all of that. No, I actually have his PhD thesis okay. sitting, in my, sitting in my records. So, but, but so it was not, it was not in, it was not a pixel sort of thing. I was, I was, I was living in the world of, um, uh, effectively uh, oscilloscopes and analog devices that knew how to draw and control drawing images on a screen. So you wrote in assembly language in Fortran and you wrote, you wrote point graphics and you wrote subroutines to do squares and circles and cubes and uh, perspective transformations oh, and all that. That. I, that actually came, that actually, I did some of that at Patel because I was making films that were trying to communicate complex processes, including, and the one that, that, that sticks in my mind was one that was devoted to showing how a uh, mechanical engineer was able to predict, or manufacturing engineer, sorry, he was a Turkish guy, could communicate, um, <clears throat> could simulate forging processes for turbine blades. And we made a film out of that. And it turned out to be very, very highly informative because it showed that he had a bug in his program <coughs> that he didn't know about. Um, uh, so, so that whole thing happened, but concurrent with that, um, Battelle's use of the 4060 was pretty much constrained to um, doing line graphs and histograms and things of that nature. I started doing animation, as I said, and wrote my own procedure library to do that, figured out how to do typesetting um, with, a, with, with, some, with some characters from Alan Hershey at uh, Naples Research Labs. And did some other work along those lines, just trying to understand how to use batch processing better. Patel had also gotten involved in the, um, in, in, uh, cathode ray tube with, uh, sorry, direct view storage tubes with a machine with, from a company called Computech that turned it, that eventually was eaten up by uh, Tektronix. But ironically, what happened is that, that Battelle also was approached to purchase by from control data a large screen interactive device called a CyberGraphic 777 terminal. And I'm not sure whose idea it was, uh, because it wasn't my, I can't get, take credit for this idea. But what, but what control data wanted to do is get in, into the world of 3D, in, in interactive 3D, as companies like Adage, Vector General were doing already with many computers, 
but they wanted to do it from a mainframe based terminal uh, to try to take market share away from the IBM 2250. All of these are vector devices. And you, I'm sure you remember that you could do, you could manipulate and rotate things on an adage terminal or, a, uh, or a, uh, an early Evans and Sutherland terminal or a, a vector general and actually start doing some 3D work. Well, control data wanted to get into that market. And so they hired Battelle to build a procedure library extension to their basic package that would do 3D on a local, on the local control machine for the cyber graphics terminal. And I was the guy who did the, all, the, all the work to make 3D possible on a control data cyber graphics terminal. We, we uh, grew were, up on uh, Tektronix 4013s and uh, yep. I was convinced that APL was a great language. And of course you couldn't see the animation on the 4013, but you could, uh, you know, lay down a series of, you take the frame advance out of the loop and it drew on top of itself so you can see how the motion flowed. Right. And then, you know, later we moved to pixel, but that was, we used those for many, many, many years. Yeah, so, and, so I, I, there, was, I, there were actually professors that I, I worked with when I was in, in, in Ohio who used the, the notion of a direct view storage to, to their advantage. And what they wound up doing is, is instead of erasing the screen for a next frame, they would do things like track trace motion like this. They would trace it and do it on, add, add a little bit more time, another time step. And you could see how graphs would get constructed for doing you know, harmonic motion or, or, any, or, or any kind of uh, a curve that a kinematic sort of thing. And they just didn't bother to erase. So they were able to do very interesting animation that way. How long did you stay at Battelle? So I was at Battelle for five years. And as uh, it, was, it was, so one of the other things that, I, I, that Battelle influenced me with is that Battelle was a place where there were all sorts of wild and crazy, uh, all sorts of wild and crazy research. Uh, it was at, during, Early, you know, I, you may know that Battelle was uh, founded as a will through a will from a guy named Gordon Battelle. And among some of the crazy projects they got involved with were things like um, perfecting the final, the final processes for xerography. So Battelle had a huge endowment at one time that was due to the fact that they got a whole bunch of shares of the original Xerox company because, the, because of perfecting, perfecting uh, Xerography. They were able to do things like uh, figure out how they, you know, you might remember the sandwich money that had clad, they had a whole bunch of, of crazy chemists and mechanical engineers and manufacturing engineers, um, physicists and the like. And I was, really impressed with how you could use computing to work with all sorts of scientific and engineering organization problems. problems. And it turns out that, that when we started doing the, the interactive computer graphics stuff with the cyber graphics terminal, uh, and even on the and even on Tektronix 4014s and the like, um, what was what was most interesting uh, was that I was able to get able to do things with subjects that I had not been exposed to, well outside the domain of hardcore computer science, uh, and I found that to be fascinating. Uh, so I, I became far more uh, I broadened my interests in science, engineering, and, and that sort of stuff. You must have attended the early ULAID conferences. I did. I did, in fact. So were you at, were you at those, Judson? I, I was, my introduction was SIGGRAPH in 73. And, oh, uh, was SIGGRAPH was the organization in 73. Yeah. Right, right. So ULAID was just a little bit before I discovered computer graphics. Yeah, so <laughs> my very first professional conference was a ULAID conference. And so uh, th these were for... So, 
uh, SC4020s and 4060s in 1973, I think, 72 or 73. And it was a, a memorable conference because it was held at the Playboy Club in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> And the Playboy, the Lake Geneva. We won't, we won't tell people that. <laughs> Go ahead. No, there, there's some interesting, there's some interesting side stories about that with uh, my 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 dear wife and my friend Ed Edwards' wife. But anyway, so that's a, that's a, that's for a different time, Judson, not for this. Yes, time. sir. I am. Uh, the the. Um, but I I learned that there were people who did things outside. Uh, I actually went to a, there was a second, I went to a second UAE conference in, in, must have been 73 and met Nelson Max in St. Louis because he was also working on, on microphone recorder sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 1974, in addition to working on this interactive graphics terminal, um, Battelle would sell research projects to many different organizations and um, a group from Washington came in and said, we want to buy 3D computer graphics terminals to help uh, understand high, high altitude imagery. They wanted to do it in 3D. They wanted to do it as fast as possible and, and help their analysts out. Uh, the organization was the CIA and they wound up funding um, uh, this fellow Edwards and me to wander around the country and meet people and do re hands-on research to find out what we believed would be the best solution to their problems. Uh, and I was able to meet some people that I never would have made, met in, in ordinary circumstances, including uh, no, I got I, we got to meet Ivan Sutherland at that time and and look at all the and John Stodhammer, Turner Witted, Mary Witten. I met them during that time. Um, when was your first SIGGRAPH? 1974. So tell, me that that. First, tell me about that, please. Huh? I'm sorry. Tell no, us so, about that, please. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll finish I'll finish my story with these these cats. So we wound up doing that project. We actually got into CIA headquarters in DC and got to take a look at how PIs do their work. And it's a fascinating process. Um, it is not for the faint of heart and it's not easy. Um, they did things that I didn't think possible, but we got, we, so we, I got to meet a lot of people I didn't know. SIGGRAPH who came rolling around at that time as, an, or as a conference after about a year of official organization. Um, and because it was at the University of Colorado camp on the campus in, in Boulder, I found out about it and we decided, and Edwards and I wound up going to that, that conference in Boulder. Um, and it was another example of how SIGGRAPH was starting to, to, to expose, actually did expose, a broad variety of applications with a lot of, with a significant amount of emphasis on interaction. Uh, and I think that's probably why SIGGRAPH was originally named the Conference uh, for Computer Graphics and Interactive Techniques because that was the big deal. People were really trying to understand how to take advantage of this graphics technology so they could do their jobs more straightforwardly. And you um, got seduced to go to Boeing. Well, so that, that's, a, that's kind of an interesting, so in 77, so, so we continued working on applications and the like through the, the rest of the 70s, um, wound up going to, so I'm, I'm one of those, I'm the only person who has been to every North American cigarette conference. So I wound, wound up, the only one that would have been in question was Bowling Green, but that was driving distance from Columbus. <laughs> so it was easy to convince people to go to, go to Bowling Green um, in Philadelphia and San Jose. Uh, in 1977, very interesting things about a personal career. Um, as 
you discover that there are certain things that you want to do uh, and are not ready for particular things that others think they want you to do. In 77, Patel's management decided that I should be a manager. <laughs> And I decided that was not not in my that was not in my interest best interest at the time, uh, and there were other circumstances involved. So um, I started applying for jobs around the country. The job market was much better, especially for somebody with five years of experience. And the things just started happening. I had a, a few offers, including one from Boeing that I had turned down because the salary, it didn't meet my salary expectations. One of my professors at the University of Colorado had gone to Boeing on sabbatical and saw me in a film that I had made. I was the, uh, I was the, de I was the demo jockey in this film and he saw me in this film and said, and said, said, oh, I know that guy. <laughs> it turned out to be me. And he persuaded his group to make a better offer than the original one I had gotten at Boeing. I wandered, wandered off to Boeing. So we have um, about 15 minutes left and I want to okay. hurry you into what I have a hypothesis of what you achieved at Boeing, although I have no factual basis at all. But what I want to bring out, if it's possible, <laughs> is this uh, idea of building models of airplanes, perhaps, uh, which are three-dimensional structures, but also the idea that in computer graphics, we don't just model things, but we model things like airflows. And so there is this total, um, uh, uh, in, in, in other words, computer graphics isn't just about the object, but it's about, and it's not about just building the object, but it's about how the object uh, interacts with the environment. And if that's part of your world, please Absolutely. charge into so, that. Okay. So let me, so let me tell you, let me tell you a little, I'll give you a little backstory on what happened at, at Boeing. So Boeing was involved in, in commercial CAD CAM systems at the time. They had not, they had done everything uh, basically on paper through the seven, for the 737 and 747. 757 and 767 come along in the late 70s and Boeing decided that they were going to start building on standard computer-aided design packages from a company called Gerber and, and from Computer Vision. All direct view storage tubes and mini computers. They had more than their share of problems because uh, they were trying to do, they were trying to replicate the drafting system. So Boeing started a research group to build its own CAD, CAD environment, its own CAD system. That research group featured a number of folks, not me, but I had, but one of the people assigned to that group was a guy named Lauren Carpenter, uh, who has a wonderful reputation in cigarette and it's well deserved, and a mathematician named Jeff Lane, who was one of which Riesenfeld's students. Um, I had gotten to meet Carpenter early on, and I knew that Boeing actually knew something about graphics because I was able to talk to Lauren. <laughs> he was doing stuff early on. And we became, uh, Edwards came out to Boeing as well, and we started a computer-aided design new system research group for Boeing uh, that eventually grew into uh, a full-fledged commercial CAD system that Boeing tried to sell unsuccessfully, but it was a great system. It introduced, well, I think it was a great system because I was the technical lead on it. Um, it introduced um, industrial strength, non-uniform rational beast lines. It, it, it introduced user interface management systems, device independent, it was a crazy system. Long story short, um, uh, the, the project was eventually sold to General Motors and EDS in the late 80s. But I learned a lot about how the world of software development works, how the peril of scale applies to everything, uh, especially in the commercial airplane business. And throughout through the 90s and, and until I retired in 2016, I was the guy who was responsible for trying to visualize as much of a commercial airplane as possible 
and introduced a field called visual analytics to Boeing for looking at non-geometric data. Um, <clears throat> but it, it turns out that your, your observation about what a complex object like an airplane entails is right on. It, it, it's, even, it's even crazier than that because a company like Boeing turned out to be ideal for a techno junkie like me. Boeing does more weird stuff with science and technology. And I, I often make the comment that what Boeing, the Boeing staff has far broader and broader interests in technology as pieces than any course catalog you can possibly imagine. They will do things that I was, I've been shocked at. Um, I was lucky enough to become a, a senior technical fellow at Boeing, which is a fantastic job if you can get it. There aren't many, there were fewer senior technical fellows than there were uh, Boeing vice presidents when I left. <laughs> but, but in that role, I was had the opportunity to see across all of Boeing's products, satellites, defense pieces, rockets. Uh, yeah, yes. That Boeing was was only they did they owned Rocketdyne for a while, but but they the the span of technology and the technologies that you need to make those things work were just like they were they were like candy to me. It was fascinating and inspiring to see what people could do. And I, I've met rocket scientists. I've gotten to work with people who are doing hypersonics and, and complex materials and everything you, can, everything you can imagine. It's a whole long story in and of itself. But I also found out that a company like Boeing also tries to inspire and use advanced technologies in ways that are unconventional. So Boeing did a lot of work, especially in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, that truly advanced the world of computer graphics. And that story is not often known and not often told. Um, they did everything from inventing, from coining the term computer graphics, a guy named, uh, um, uh, ah. cool. Bill Fetter, you're thinking of. No, Bill Fetter didn't. He actually, the guy's name was, the guy who invented the term was Vern Hudson. Okay. And he was in Wichita, and Fetter picked it up and popularized it. We have about 10 minutes left. Yep. So, 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 so your comment about, about what, so your comment about what a company like Boeing has to do in order to understand and design airplanes turns out to be even more complex than the computer and engineering work that you're talking about with fluid computational fluid dynamics. That's commonly handled through commercial packages. Uh, what Boeing found, the other thing that Boeing has to do is understand how to not only design and analyze, but also how to manufacture, build, how to you know, actually cut the raw materials, build and maintain those objects. And so the work that I did in the, oh, probably from, in, from the early 2000s through, through, and it's still in use today, worked on understanding those 3D models in, in total. So you could actually look at an entire Boeing 787 on a conventional laptop and people were able to use that across the value stream. Everything from design and figuring out uh, tolerances and the like, to figuring out system separation, et cetera, but to doing manuf complex manufacturing tasks um, and other maintenance, maintenance things. So it, it was pretty fascinating all in all. I wanna bring you back to SIGGRAPH for a minute. Sure. And that is that you've attended most if not all of the conferences uh, and um, I would like you to, it, it, I, I have a, a suspicion, a theory, it's not a good one, but it's a theory that somewhere along the line, SIGGRAPH and the CAD-CAM world separated 
likewise, SIGGRAPH and the game world kind of separated. I don't think the latter one concerns you, but the SIGGRAPH and the CAD CAM world, the flow dynamics and the, uh, right now it seems very focused on animation in Hollywood and it seems to have lost some of its, the you, the you, the Nelson Maxes, the Jeffrey Potsdamers don't seem to be as well represented in the organization as, it, as they once were. Would you, in a positive way, can you give that a spin? <laughs> is, a, is this is this a is this a, a chemistry question, Judson? <laughs> chemistry. Um, yeah, positive electron spin or negative or whatever you want. Yeah, to call positive it. spin. <laughs> so so we, we both benefited from SIGGRAPH a great deal, I think. I have and benefited we, extraordinarily from SIGGRAPH. It's, it's been it's been my professional home since its inception. Um, and a lot of it is because of the people. So if you look at the evolution of the way the SIGGRAPH program has, has happened and SIGGRAPH in general has happened, different, the, the, it, in many ways, I believe that computer graphics is driven by the, the opportunities to use it effectively. That's why I got interested in the whole notion of being able to communicate with pictures, right? From cave art on, it was, it's, a communica it's a communication tool. In a lot of ways, I believe that SIGGRAPH is a communication tool. Or the SIGGRAPH develops graphics as a tool for others to use. It depends on what the hot, what the topics are that SIGGRAPH wants to, that, SIG, that has the most representation and sway. And if you look at the evolution of, of the way that um, SIGGRAPH wind, winds up evolving, working, is that the applications that are dominating the computer graphics world right now are uh, visual effects and, and, and movies. I think games are still involved from a, a, a uh, the, the, the whole idea of being able to get lifelike things on lifelike and realistic things on a screen. Uh, but what SIGGRAPH is not doing as much of is what's going on with the interactive parts. And what has happened as a natural evolution, I think, is that the interest groups that I was with, like computer-aided design, like computer-aided engineering, scientific visualization, information visualization, visual analytics, com uh, interactive techniques for computer in human interaction, all have their own more focused special interests that are highly successful conferences in, uh, in their own right. Uh, the one that probably has the least is computer aided design because that's dominated by a few big players and their user groups do that work. My comment though, is that it's essential for SIGGRAPH and I think the history of SIGGRAPH to help communicate what we have learned about all of these computer graphics techniques, it's essential that we remember and learn that these are applicable today, just as they were 40, 50 years ago. They don't have to be the focus of the, of the conference by any means, but understanding and learning is essential from, for this whole history business. Um, understanding how a person like me got into the business of computer of computer graphics um, is is a big deal um, because for students and for young professionals there are certain things that you can't take for granted when you come ultimately that you can't take for granted in terms of how do you make your career how do you mold your career into something that is broadly useful and usable, I'd argue. Um, my job, I got, I got kicks when my computer graphics work was used outside of, my, uh, outside of what I did for myself. Uh, I mentioned Lauren Carpenter earlier. He, he did his uh, first practical system working, working for me uh, back in 1979 and 1980, his first practical film. Lauren, Lauren probably still gets some kicks from having that work show up in a Star Trek movie. 
Um, I get I got great kicks from watching things that I built that I was responsible for the design and evolution for in computer graphics, watching thousands of people use that. Um, and that's something that I think as a young technologist, those young technologists, the more they understand that what motivates them to do that work is a big deal. So we've got five minutes left. So we're both retired and we <laughs> have <damn>. youngsters <laughs> who are uh, all, we, they, they, they don't have to know about transformation matrices or linear algebra. They got a box and it, they don't have to know about shading. They push a button and it's this kind of smooth shading or shiny shading or whatever. Uh, and, uh, but we also have, uh, Technologies like I hear a lot about uh, artificial intelligence. I work for companies who do motion picture restoration, of course, scratches and yeah, right. uh, are big problems. You've uh, expressed a lot of interest in how images are analyzed or how they're interpreted. I've worked much of my career in advertising where it's all about oh, yeah. leading the eye. So let's, if we yep. could conclude by and I'll, at the end, I'll say a good, we'll, we'll wrap, we'll do a minute of wrap, but we got four minutes left. So please uh, expound on uh, what a young person, how a young person might approach, you know, what's, what's ahead for them and how they might, what are some, some important things they might need to know, which aren't necessarily, uh, you know, how to do an if statement in Fortran. Well, it, so, so I, I think it's, it's essential to understand what the foundations of the technology that you're working on are all about. So while you may not have to intimately know how a transformation matrix works, understanding the fundamentals of the linear algebra, the material science, et cetera, that causes a visual image to appear on the screen with some degree of fidelity, that it is able to trick the eye into thinking that it's really a photograph, for example, or how to use a stylistic abstract form to communicate more readily in, in medical imaging. I think understanding those foundations is essential. Okay, I certainly give credit to my foundations, God help us from the Jesuits on understanding how the English language works and how to be able to use it uh, in, a, in a, reasonably, a reasonably coherent manner. That being said, it is really important. It, was, it has been really important for me as a computer science guy, uh, a computer scientist, to understand that what I do has, has, has and can impact what other people do. And it, it's, not, it's not easy. There are two things that I tell audiences when I give uh, general talks. Number one, Technology transition is a really hard thing to do, and it's a contact sport. You have to get involved and actually try to make it happen. The other thing that I try to tell people that I think is often missing from in the education world and SIGGRAPH in, in every organization in general is that scale kills. As you keep adding things to a complex environment, things break. And I have so many examples of how that's happened, both in, in real life and in my computing background, that it's, uh, it's actually kind of scary. You have to really plan for it and make sure it works. So there you go. Well, thank, thank you for that. And we uh, appreciate talking to you and getting to know you. And thank you for, on the behalf of SIGGRAPH, spending an hour with us and sharing uh, insights into how we got into this wonderful profession. I would love to talk to you more. And um, I couldn't agree with you more about uh, kids, youngsters, college students, high school students learning the fundamentals. Uh, I use my high school algebra and geometry. I still have my high school algebra and geometry books. <laughs> and uh, I went back to, I've gone back to them again and again and again when I was doing my first software to, um, oh, yeah learn you know everything from sines and cosines uh, but i find a lot of uh, youngsters don't want to learn the basics and i think that's so so critical um, and i've taught from time to time and met resistance from students who don't want to do that or, but, or teach or teachers who want to teach. we are and i think i share your pride in having somebody else look at something you've made and uh 
that's a great feeling. And I want to congratulate you on a great career and your SIGGRAPH attendance. And I hope we made Mary happy. <laughs> and she doesn't want us to do this over again. And if she does, I'll, I'll certainly enjoy another talk with you. It sounds so, great. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk again. Yes, sir. <laughs>